Okay, here's the question from Alex. Could you explain the truth about the moral status of the 700 Palestinians who fled as part of the 1948 invasion? How complicit were they or subsets of them, uh, complicit in, in, I guess, the violence against the Jews? Um, how should they have been treated? How were they treated? Are any reparations owed to any of them? All right, so this is, this is a great question. And it's a it's a, uh, a a fairly complex question. So here we're talking about seven hundred thousand people who were residents of what at the end of the nineteen forty eight war was became Israel. Um, uh, the 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 armistice lines of nineteen forty eight, which became modern Israel. Uh, seven hundred thousand Palestinians, seven hundred thousand Arabs who lived in the land that became Israel. Uh, were either left that land or were kicked out of that land um, uh, during the war that occurred uh, during 1948. Just a quick history, uh, because I think just a quick history in terms of the sequence of events here, because I think the sequence of events is important to understanding uh, both practically and morally uh, what happened here. In, in November 1947, uh, 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 or, or before November 1947, the British who had a mandate from the UN to basically run uh, the territory that is uh, considered today Israel and Palestine was called Palestine by the British, uh, but included for much of that period, included Jordan as well. Uh, the, the, the British decided they wanted out. They, they, they wanted to leave. It was costly for them. They were winding down their empire anyway, post-World War II. And uh, they'd had enough of, of, of the, 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 the Jews and the, and the Muslims in, uh, in uh, the Middle East. And they were basically divvying up the Middle East and, and, and handing over, um, handing over uh, uh, power to local authorities all over the Middle East. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a country created by the British. Uh, Iraq, Syria, Syria and, and Lebanon were countries created by uh, uh, the, the British and the, and the uh, French. Jordan was created by the British. These are not countries that had existed. These are not countries that had any, any, any kind of reality. They were created by uh, British and French post-World War I because they were all lands that they had occupied as part of defeating the Ottoman Empire. Part of this was also what was called Palestine, uh, the, the section between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, so they went to the UN and said, look, get us out of this. We want, we're leaving. You decide what happens here. And the, and the United Nations voted, um, uh, not overwhelmingly, it was close, but voted for the partition of, uh, of the territory into two states, a, a Palestinian state for the Arabs and a, a, a Jewish state for the Jews and uh, called Israel. And uh, they drew up the borders. The borders were very uh, uh, restrictive. They basically tried to include uh, population uh, concentrations of, uh, of uh, Arabs uh, would be part of the Palestinian state, the Arab state, and uh, centers of, uh, uh, population centers of Jews, where Jews were dominant, would be, uh, would be Jewish. Anyway, it, 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 the Jews in Palestine celebrated. Uh, they went into the streets, they danced, there are pictures of this. Uh, the next day, the Arabs started a military offensive against Israel. Not Arabs from outside, but the, 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 what I call Palestinians, the Arabs inside that geographic area, started a violent activity against Israel, with, with, against the Jews, with the idea that before the British left, they wanted to create a reality on the ground where there were basically no Jews there, or, or the Jews had been so marginalized that it, it made no sense to give them any kind of land. So the idea that the Arabs had, that the Palestinians had, that was to occupy as much of this land, to kill as many Jews as possible, to drive as many Jews into the sea as possible, and, and basically to be able to occupy this territory as, quote, a Palestinian uh, uh, territory. In May of 1948, the British basically said, we're leaving, uh, and they packed up and left. On that day, uh, the, uh, uh, Israel basically declared independence. Um, and on that day, also seven, as soon as they, uh, the, the, the Israelis declared independence, the armies of seven Arab countries invaded 
Israel and, and, and a war was begun. Interestingly enough, and, and it's always important to note this, that when those seven countries invaded, their goal was not to create a Palestinian state, not to create an Arab state. Their goal was to carve this territory up among themselves. Egypt wanted the south. Jordan wanted uh, 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 big chunks of, of uh, what is today, eastern Israel. Uh, Syria and Lebanon wanted uh, northern parts of Israel. They all wanted uh, pieces of it. They all, you know, wanted... They, probably if they would have won, they would have started fighting each other for who gets the rule Jerusalem, let's say, and things like that. Um, as part of the Arab invasion... As part of the invasion of these seven countries, the Arab, uh, the, the Arab countries communicated to the civilian population, the Arab civilian population within this territory. They told them, look, guys, get out of the way. There's going to be a war. It's going to be brutal. Get out of the way. If you want to fight on our side, join the fighting. But if you're just a civilian, um, if you're not, if you, if you're not going to raise weapons against them, just get out of the way. What we suggest to you is go to, go to Jordan, go to Lebanon. Uh, those are the primary places they went. Go to Egypt, but the primary places were Jordan and, Le and Lebanon, primarily Jordan. Jordan's the closest. Um, and get out of the way so that when we, uh, you know, start bombing these cities, when we start uh, uh, fighting these wars, you won't get in the way. You know, it's just like Israel has told the Palestinians, go south, right? Because we're, we're attacking in the north. And what you saw in the days following, a long, and there are photos of this, long convoys of Arabs leaving their homes in, in Jaffa, which is very close to Tel Aviv, Haifa, uh, which was always a mixed city and still is a mixed city, uh, uh, the Galilee, uh, uh, you know, parts of, uh, you know, parts of southern and, and midsection of Israel, just getting in their cars and, and driving away and leaving. And, and going, going to where they were promised. And the Arab countries said, look, we're going to win this very quickly. This is not going to take long. I mean, how many Jews are there? A few hundred thousand Jews? The, the tens of millions of us. We're going to wipe them out. And when we wipe them out, and literally, it was about wiping them out, you will be able to come back. Um, so some of the 700,000, a big chunk of the 700,000, were Arabs who left because Arab countries urged them to leave under the idea that they could come back once victory was achieved. Now, some of them left because the fighting started and indeed they discovered they were in the crossfire. And maybe they were part of the people fighting and they discovered they were losing. And rather than um, suffer the full defeat, uh, they ran away. So some of them just ran away, ran away because they were in the crossfire, ran away because they were losing, ran away because Israel was, was beating them. Indeed, Israel increased its territory from the UN partition to the ceasefire in 1949 of this war of independence. It had grown because it had occupied a lot of the territory uh, where fighting was going on. And then a third category of people were actually kicked out of their homes by Israelis. And, and I would say here, there are, I would split this category into two. One, uh, some uh, segments of the Israeli military, some, uh, some units misbehaved. Uh, there were indeed, you know, uh, very few, but a couple of occasions in which uh, Jewish forces massacred civilians, uh, uh, civilians on the, Palestine, on the Arab side. Very few, once or twice. Many such occurrences, by the way, of Arabs massacring Jews. And there were also occasions where they kicked people out of their homes and, 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 and by, uh, pointed guns at them and, and forced them to run away. So that's one category. And a second category is there were certain villages, certain locations where they had fought against Israel, where their location was strategic, 
um, in terms of the security of the state of Israel, and they basically told people to leave because they were in the way and they were strategically inhibiting their ability to, uh, to defend uh, Israel. So how do, you, how do you think about these people? Well, you know, most of them, the ones who left because they were urged to leave, the ones uh, who, um, who uh, uh, fled uh, because uh, they were in the crossfire or because they were losing, the ones who uh, left because Israel had a strategic interest in the location uh, 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 of where they, where they lived. Um, well, we'll put that one aside. So the first two. I'd say those first two categories uh, fall under the category of you started a war and you lost it. Their leadership, whether they supported it or not, and most of them supported it, their leadership started a war. And they listened to their leadership. They followed the suggestions of the leadership. And they were a victims of war. Many of them are victims of the decision making of these seven Arab countries that invaded Israel. And therefore, Israel has no responsibility towards them. They vacated their land. They abandoned their property. The property is abandoned and can be used by anybody else for productive purposes. The, again, uh, when you lose a war, you lose a war. Right? You, 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 a, a war you start. We are victims of the wars uh, that the Arab countries have started against Israel, and not only the soldiers who die have died in the war, Arab and Israeli, but the, but the victims are th these Palestinians who don't have a home, were promised one, but don't have one. The moral responsibility for taking care of them, the moral responsibility for, uh, should be on those who urge them to leave. Instead, what has happened is that uh, uh, the refugee camps that the Palestinians established, first in Jordan and then in Lebanon and in other places around, some of them in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, basically have 70-something uh, uh, years later still in existence. Uh, Arabs have uh, kept them as second, third-class citizens in their own countries. They're not citizens of Lebanon, even though they've lived there for decades. They're not citizens of Jordan, even though they've lived there for decades. They're treated horribly by Arab countries. And instead of resettling them, giving them citizens, making them, they've kept them as refugees, as, a, as something to dangle over Israel and as something to use um, uh, to elicit guilt from the Europeans for their support and, and Americans for their support of Israel. So there are two other categories. One category is category of people who uh, Israel required them to leave for a variety of reasons. Now, if these were people who were engaged in combat against the Israelis, then again, I think they have no claim. Once you initiate violence, you can't say, oh, but property rights. No, you lose your rights. And you use your claim to the property that you used in order to engage in the violence. And if Israel needed to uh, throw some people out because the security demanded that uh, this particular land be, be, be free of hostiles, then so be it. There is one group that I think does have a claim here. If there are cases in which the, the, the Israeli military was gratuitously forced people off their land, threw them out, murdered some of them, like they did in uh, Dir Yassin and, and, and maybe one other place, but Dir Yassin is the famous one, then those Palestinians have a legal claim against Israel. They have a legal claim against the government where it is clearly gratuitous, not as a part of, of a war action, not as an act of self-defense, or 
if after the war was over, the Israeli government confiscated land from Palestinians without giving them any compensation, once hostilities were done, and, and that has happened, it's happened in the West Bank, it's happened in other places, they should be, they should be able to sue and get their land back, or at very least, under the idea of eminent domain in the United States, get compensated for it. But just to be clear, the 700,000 Palestinians that are out there, uh, the, and some of them, uh, those ones who are gratuitously kicked out, you know, should have some claim to come back to their land and their property. But that's a fraction. Maybe it's 10,000, probably less than that. The 700,000 have no right to return to their land. They initiated force. They've lost all rights to that. Their government, their representatives, their leaders, their community leaders, their political leaders, their religious leaders, all initiated force in their behalf, in their name. They lost all rights, all claims. Now, the Arabs who stayed in Israel won. They won the lottery. Because the Arabs who stayed in Israel, who didn't run, who didn't listen to their leadership, who stayed and didn't fight and weren't killed in the crossfire, they landed up living in the freest country in the Middle East. They landed up having their rights protected better than in any other country in the Middle East, better than any Arab country. They landed up hitting the, the jackpot in terms of wealth, in terms of freedom. All right, that's probably a longer answer than uh, expected. All right, second question. This one's a long question. How would he answer this argument by a smart opponent of Israel who claims to be for property rights? Israeli Jews lived peacefully in Akko and elsewhere before Zionism decided to establish an exclusive homeland and kick Palestinians out and deny them their property. The idea of driving Jews out simply never existed in Palestine before Zionism. I don't think another. Uh, I don't think there's anything special about Palestine, Israel. If you turned any country into a national homeland for one group and kicked another group out and took away their property, they'd get endless conflict too. If you had property rights respected regardless of religion, ethnicity, you'd get peace. I think there's room for all Palestinians and Israelis to live peacefully together. But if the ruling regime continues to deny property rights based on religion, ethnicity, Unfortunately, conflict will continue until one group is eradicated. It's looking like we're getting close to the latter outcome. I mean, I mean, this gets a number of things wrong. It, 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 the way it's conceptually framed is wrong, and the history is wrong. It, it, it is true that under the Ottoman Empire, under the rule of law that was the Ottoman Empire, for whatever good that law was, there was a rule of some law in the territory called Palestine in those days. Jews and Arabs lived fairly peacefully. Jews had to pay an extra tax because they were Jews to the authorities, ultimately in Istanbul or in Damascus, where, they, where, they were, where the regional government was. But there was no Palestine. There was, uh, and there was, there was some respect for property rights uh, under Ottoman law. Uh, Jews had certain property rights and Arabs had certain property rights. But you have to take into account that there was an overarching legal system here. Right. Now, starting in the late 19th century, Jews in relatively speaking large numbers relative to the existing population in this territory. Remember, Palestine in the 19th century was swampland. It was, it was an awful place. It, was, it had a, a, a very small population. Uh, it, you know, focused in Jerusalem and a few other cities. Uh, there was no Tel Aviv. There was almost nothing on the coast, Jaffa, Akko, uh, Haifa. But these were, again, very, very small places. The population was very small. And uh, Jews started emigrating to uh, this area. Now, some of them had a dream of one day establishing a Jewish nation here. Some of them have a dream of, yeah, this is our ancient biblical land or whatever. But the fact is that most of them 
were atheists. Uh, almost all the immigrants of the late 19th century came from, uh, were coming from Russia and Germany. They were secular Jews. They were atheists. And, and most of them were just escaping from horrors of, of what was going on in their native countries. The Russians were mostly socialists who thought they could establish a communism in, in, in what was Palestine before you could get it in Russia itself. They established kibbutzim. They, they started uh, farming communities. And the only reason they could do this is because they purchased property rights again. They purchased land from rich Arabs, or, or Arabs generally, Arab farmers. They purchased land from the Ottoman authorities uh, that might have owned land. A lot of uh, the land was owned by rich Arabs in Damascus, or maybe rich Turks uh, all the way in Istanbul. Um, and the other way in which they gained land, they gained property, was using, um, uh, taking possession of unused, unclaimed land, swamps, desert. Um, uh, swamps were dried, and, and they gained property rights over those. There was no way for the Jews during this period to take anybody's land. They had no political power. They had no weapons. You know, and, and they had no facility for taking other people's land. It is, uh, but it is the case that starting pretty early on, and certainly once the Ottomans left, uh, but even, even in the late 19th century, early 20th century, during the Ottoman period, but accelerated after the Ottomans left, hostilities between Jews and, and, and Arabs increased. The Arabs noticed that these Jews were moving in. Yes, they were buying land, but they didn't like the fact that the number of Jews was increasing. And they started, hostilities started increasing in the very late 19th century, early 20th century. Now, in 1919, the uh, 19... Uh, 19, of course, the Ottoman Empire lost uh, uh, the war, and these territories fell into the hands of the British. The British got a UN mandate uh, to, to, to manage uh, these territories. And, and during this period, uh, there were pieces of land all over the place. There were not a huge number of Arabs in the area defined as Palestine, and Palestine was never, had never been a state never been a country, not since before the Romans had there been a country called Palestine. And Britain was in the business of divvying the territory up into states, into countries. And uh, one of the considerations, and, and uh, Jews all over Europe lobbied for, well, why don't we use this opportunity to carve out uh, the, the, this piece of territory where there are quite a few Jews, and, and uh, they're not that many Arabs, they're in the majority, but they're not that many, into a future Jewish state. The Arabs have lots of state around. Uh, you know, Arabs in Palestine, if they want to live under Arab rule, they can move somewhere else, but, but create a, a state that is, uh, that will be accessible for Jews to move into. Not to take anybody's land, not to steal anybody's land, just to move into move into by buying land and by cultivating land that had not existed before. I mean, Tel Aviv was a city created uh, on land that didn't belong to anybody. And some of the land was purchased from Arab landowners. But a lot of it was just sand on the beach that just wasn't owned by anybody. So in the Balfour Declaration, uh, there was the declaration of a Jewish state, but not a state where land would be taken from private landholders who were Arab and given to private landholders who were Jewish. No. The idea was that the land that was not owned by anybody, not owned by any Arab landowner or any Jewish landowner, but was owned in a sense, the extent that you can apply ownership to this, by the British now because they happen to occupy it and they had basically conquered it from the, the uh, Ottomans, and remember that in most countries, sadly, even in the United States, 75% of all the land west of the Mississippi is owned by the state. So the Ottoman Empire owned most of the land in what is known as Palestine. 
And so the British inhabited that. So by saying, okay, much of this land, this land that will be granted to a new state that is going to be friendly for Jewish immigration and going to be a, a Jewish state, is not taking private property from anybody. There was no private property. Now then, just to fill in the history, then the reality is that from 1919, the end of World War I, through 1948, when the British left, Britain kept changing its mind about a Jewish state. Yes, a Jewish state, no a Jewish state. On a number of occasions uh, in, the, in the teens, in the 20s, and in the 30s, uh, Arabs uh, uh, took up arms and, and killed Jews, fought against the British, but mainly killed Jews. The British were trying to keep the peace. My grandfather was injured in one of these attacks in Hebron uh, while he was a student there and, and, and left, left Palestine um, as a consequence. Uh, but the Arabs, there were huge Arab uprisings where Jews were killed, like they were killed outside of Gaza. And the British brought back peace. But throughout these periods, as Jews migrated into Palestine, and the rate of migration was not very fast. It was not, not like millions came. They basically bought land. The British didn't give them anything. They bought land from Arabs, or they settled unoccupied land and turned it into productive land. The property rights of Palestinians or Arabs was never violated and has not been violated with the one exception I gave earlier about those who were kicked out gratuitously. The land of the Palestinians was either taken from them because they initiated violence, but those who stayed, even those who stayed who initiated violence, got their land back. There were Arab villages all over Israel, Arab towns, Arab cities. They, the Arabs in Akko, the Arabs in, uh, what else did he, Jerusalem, the Arabs in, uh, in Haifa, the Arabs in uh, Jaffa, all still live peacefully with Jews. And their rights, their property rights have all been respected. Indeed, the property rights of Arabs have never really been violated. So this is not an issue of rights violations. Never has been a property rights violation. That's not the issue. I agree that if, uh, if the Arabs had settled with, yeah, if Jews want to buy property and they want to live here, fine. And, you know, if, if, as long as property rights are respected, who cares who the government is in Jerusalem or whatever, yeah, they would, none of this would happen. We would all be living happily, peacefully in Israel, or whoever would have been, right? There are millions of Arabs who live today in Israel whose property rights are fully protected. Now, granted, Israel, like most Western states, violates property rights in all kinds of ways, Jews and Arabs. Does, does Israel sometimes discriminate against this Arab population? Sometimes, but it's minor. And they have, again, more rights than in any other country in the Middle East, and their property rights are respected more than in any other country in the Middle East. It's this conflict has never been about property rights. If it was, it could easily be resolved. The courts in Israel are pretty good about decide whose property does this belong to. And to the extent Israel has violated people's property rights, whether as a state or whether individuals have violated property rights, then Israel should be held to account on that. And the Supreme Court has indeed on occasion done that. They've returned land, uh, a property to Arabs whose land was taken from them illegitimately. But don't forget, what does it mean to say Palestinian land? There is no such thing as Palestinian land if you believe in property rights. If you believe in property rights, then there's the land of Palestinian, of Muhammad, his land. Nobody took his land away. Now, adjacent to his land was land that was owned by the Ottoman state and now is owned by the Israeli state. That was never his. And it doesn't belong to, quote, the Palestinians. And I don't think it should belong to these Israel, the Israeli state either. I think it should be privatized. It should be sold to the highest bidder. 
but we live in a we live in a world in which land is not privately owned, not all privately owned. We live in a world in which states own, in quotation marks, a, a significant portion of the land within their own country. Israel is no different than any other country in that regard, and to assign that God land, that that unclaimed land, if you will, to the ethnicity of the group that happened to have be a majority at any particular point in time is completely arbitrary and random. Israel established the country, and it's, again, the moral basis of Israel is the fact that it's a, it's a free country. It didn't just establish any country. It established a free country that actually respects property rights, including the property rights of Arabs. All right, question number three. I, I'm going through questions, those of you coming in and out. I'm going through questions submitted to me. Um, as a super chat question, but they were submitted through text, uh, and uh, they were hundred dollars each. I'll do those first, uh, and then I'll go to the super chat submitted online. Uh, answer this by the same person: Ethnic cleansing of Palestine started fifty years before Hamas was created. It was entirely premeditated, and the only possible way to build a Jewish homeland on a land that was ninety percent non-Jewish. That's just not true. It's just not true. In the 1930s, there was no ethnic, so 50 years before Hamas, Hamas was created in the 80s, the 1930s, there was no ethnic cleansing going on. Indeed, if you look at migration patterns in the late 19th century all the way until the, into the 1940s, vast numbers of, Palestinian, of Arabs migrated into what is now Israel. They were new immigrants, just like the Jews who were coming in were new immigrants. Nobody was being kicked out of Israel before the state of Israel was established. Because quite the opposite. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, who today call themselves Palestinians, were actually completely new immigrants who came from Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and Egypt and other places around the area to what was called then Palestine. And why did they come? Why did they come? Why suddenly was there a massive in-migration into this area? And the Arabs don't want to hear this, but the reality is that the Jews were created massive economic opportunities. They were building cities. They were creating farming on a scale that had never existed. They were using land that had been swamp and desert that nobody knew how to use. They were literally dying, drying swamps. They were building industry. This even, even Israelis don't know this because the socialists don't want you to know it, but there was private industry. The electrification of Palestine happened because of, of Jewish enterprise. So Jews were building industry, farming, cities, creating jobs. And Arabs in Syria and Jordan were looking at themselves and going, yeah, I mean, I, I can earn a lot more by going over there. There's a lot more job opportunities over there than over here. And they did. And they were the manual labor that built much of Israel in terms of the actual construction, right? They built the homes, the buildings, the, 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 and, and they worked in the industries. So the exact opposite of ethnic cleansing happened before 1948. Post-1948, post 19, and during 1948, I've already answered, there was no ethnic cleansing. 1948 saw them run away. You run away, you lose, tough. I don't see any moral responsibility to, of, the, of, the, of the people defending themselves to respect your so-called rights to come back, particularly when you hold, continue to hold a, 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 world, a, a, a world view, a, 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 a view that once they eliminate the very state that you demand a return to. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there was no premeditated, there was no plan. 
Um, you know, the Arabs left without Israel asking them to leave. Um, most of the asking to leave was done by, Arab, by the Arabs. Now, again, were there cases? And should the Arabs be compensated where you could show proof of it? Okay. Fine. But those are the exception, not the rule. The rule was that it was an ethnic cleansing. The rule was that it was people losing in a war and running away. Or running away in anticipation that they would win and be able to come back. Either way, Israel owes them nothing. And it was an ethnic cleansing, period. 